Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event. Um, I'm Miriam Elman. I'm the Executive Director of AEN and an Associate Professor at Syracuse University. So welcome everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces and um, it's lovely to also see new members at this event. Um, so at our event, we're gonna speak today on free speech, equality on campus, some principles and recommendations with um, Dale Carpenter. And um, before we get started, um, I do want to thank uh, Oren Gross, a uh, professor um, at University of Minnesota's Law School who chairs our um, section for faculty in law. And I'd also like to thank Dan Gordon at the University of Massachusetts Amherst who chairs our interest group in, for the Northeast because both Oren and Dan put together this fantastic spring seminar series for us. And Dale is the kickoff speaker for the series. And thank you so much, Dale, for joining us. And I'm glad you're back in your house, safe and sound in Dallas. Uh, and, and this event could happen, really excited. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Oren, but I first want to um, introduce you to Oren. I know some of you um, I know Oren Gross, maybe not all of you do. Um, so let me introduce Oren. He'll be the moderator for a number of our events uh, in the series and Dan Gordon will do some of them as well. But Professor Oren Gross is the Irving Younger Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota Law School. And he is an internationally recognized expert in the areas of international law and national security law. He holds an LLB degree magna cum laude from Tel Aviv University and an LLM and SJD degree from Harvard Law School. He's taught and held visiting positions in many institutions, Harvard Law School, Princeton University, and is the author of many articles and two award-winning books and is a member of the American Law Institute. Between 1986 and 1991, Professor Gross served as a senior legal advisory officer in the international law branch of the Israeli Defense Forces Judge Advocate General's Corps. And Professor Gross has been a member of AAN since AAN was founded in 2015. So we're very proud that Oren was among our first members. And as I mentioned, he currently serves as the chair for the section for faculty in law. Those of you in law who are not yet members of the section, Oren uh, will certainly welcome you to take part so Oren, thank you again. Dan, thank you as well. And thank you, Dale. And I'll turn it over to you, Oren. Um, thank you, Miriam, for the kind introduction and for kind of starting us off. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome you all to the first talk in a new speaker series organized by AEN section for uh, of faculty in law in collaboration with AEN's interest group uh, for the Northeast. And I take this opportunity to thank Dan Gordon, my uh, partner in crime on this. Um, the speaker series uh, will bring together really leading thinkers from both the United States and overseas um, who are going to discuss a wide range of issues uh, from free speech uh, on campus that we're going to talk about today to anti-Semitism on campus to Israeli music and developments in the Middle East. And while the speaker series is open to all AEN members and invited guests, I see some of you here as well, I invite those of you who are interested to join the section of faculty in law or if geographically relevant, the interest group for the Northeast. Um, before I introduce uh, Professor Dale Carpenter, our speaker uh, tonight, uh, please know that you can submit questions uh, via the chat function on Zoom. I somehow suspect that uh, at this point in time, we all know how to do this uh, and we will try to get as many of those answered as time permits. So it's with really a particular pleasure that I introduce our very first speaker, a friend, a former colleague at the University of Minnesota Law School, a scholar, a public intellectual, and not less importantly, a gifted uh, teacher. Uh, Professor Carpenter holds a BA degree in history, magna cum laude from uh, Yale College, and a JD uh, with honors from the uh, University of Chicago Law School. Uh, where he was also the editor-in-chief of the University of Chicago Law Review. He um, spent 16 years in the frozen tundras of uh, Minnesota, 
before he decided to go back to his native Texas, where he's currently the Judge William Holy Atwell Chair of Constitutional Law at Southern Methodist University's Dedman School of Law. Uh, Professor Carpenter is an expert in constitutional law and has published extensively in the field. Of his many publications, I just want to really highlight uh, one, the fantastic award-winning book. If you haven't read it, run quickly and get it and read it. Flagrant Conduct, the story of Lawrence V. Thomas, how a bedroom arrest decriminalized gay Americans uh, that came out in 2012 and dealt with um, the US Supreme Court uh, case of Lawrence uh, v. Texas that invalidated America's sodomy laws. Um, I also want to especially thank Dale for going on with today's talk despite the fact that he had to actually leave uh, his home as a result of the recent storm in Texas. I wasn't sure for a minute whether A, he will be able to deliver the talk today and B, whether he will do so from Texas or Cancun, but apparently some Texans are actually staying uh, put. Um, not only is Professor Carpenter an expert in constitutional law in general and First Amendment in particular, but I would also highlight the fact that he won multiple teaching awards uh, I can attest while in Minnesota, including the distinguished university teaching professor. I hated him greatly while he was in Minnesota for that. But once he moved, kind of he opened the door for the rest of us uh, to get some of those awards as well. The topic of today's talk, as we heard from Miriam, is free speech and equality on campus. Some principles and recommendations. Dale, the uh, Zoom floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Oren. Thank you to AEN. I, I do also, I do want to highlight in particular that Oren is, uh, I was going to say old colleague, but I don't want to say that. I'll say former colleague. I do see some former colleagues also um, on the Zoom session tonight, and it's good to see them also, if only electronically, as we're seeing a lot of people these days. Um, uh, Oren was a uh, uh, a, a sort of comrade in arms in intellectual terms. And uh, he was uh, also a, a good friend and has been continued to be a good friend. And I greatly appreciate uh, his inviting me and, and AEN for hosting me. Um, what I would like to do tonight is as briefly as I can present what I think are some core principles protecting the freedom of speech at universities. I mean to say public universities in particular because they are subject to First Amendment constraints, but I think also private universities, which for the most part have adopted voluntarily the principles of the First Amendment uh, for their institutions. Um, and at the same time, I want to suggest how I think the principles of free speech, which often seem in conflict with things like equality and diversity and inclusion, which are important values, um, are actually reconcilable and can be reconciled with the freedom of speech. And then I'll, I want to mention some common temptations, I think, to depart from free speech principles on campus. Um, and perhaps along the way suggest um, some areas for reform or, or some principles that should guide decision-making by universities on these matters. So first of all, some basic principles. I contend, and I don't think this is controversial, that the production and dissemination of knowledge through teaching, learning, and researching is the highest function of the university. That function serves the search for truth. It often serves democratic values and governance and the exercise of individual autonomy and liberty. Free speech is a predicate to and preservative of basically all of the university's functions as it is, I think, of all of our rights. It is so essential to the functioning of a university, especially a public university, that it's part of our federal constitution, of course, and it's part of every single state constitution. And it's present in the governing documents of all of our academic institutions that I know of. 
the constitutional commitment to free speech is well known, if not always, I think, well understood. The First Amendment mandates that the government and its institutions shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. As I said, that's also in some form or another in the state constitutions. Speech includes all modes of communication. So it includes the right to speak orally, the right to write, to display images, to engage in symbolic conduct, and to associate with others for expressive purposes, to promote, for example, causes of one type or another. The freedom of speech also includes the right not to speak, to refrain from speaking. Our constitutional tradition forbids the regulation of speech simply because that speech is uncivil, uninformed, or unwise, and even when it reaches the trifecta of all three of those at once. It protects offensive and even hateful speech. The term hate speech describes extreme forms of bigoted expression, often epithets, but other kinds of expression as well. But it's actually not a legal category recognized in our constitutional law, and it remains fully constitutionally protected. Hate speech as such is not unprotected speech. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes famously declared that if there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. And it includes the freedom of speech for people who speak in hateful ways. Under the Constitution, no public university may suppress speech on the grounds that that speech in the view of officials or administrators of the university is speech they vehemently dislike or disagree with, at least on the basis of the viewpoint or subject matter of that speech. Now, let's be clear. The principle of free speech does not mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean that all speech is protected in any time and any place or in any form. So for example, speech that explicitly advocates and imminently incites illegal conduct, speech that is obscene, speech that defames an individual, or that actually threatens or harasses a person may be regulated, may be prohibited because it's not speech. Like any institution that has to govern itself further uh, and operate effectively, the, also, the university, a university, can also limit speech to certain times and places even when the speech is otherwise protected. So those are some very basic constitutional principles. I hope they're not controversial, but these days I'm never sure whether they really are controversial or not. And I have the sense that they are not being really communicated to a lot of students around the country. And that may be because a lot of faculty are not sufficiently acquainted with them. Let me, let me talk a bit about some of the historical challenges to the freedom of speech. And this is very brief. Every age, every age confronts the temptation to allow a little less expression in order to have a little more of something else that we value highly, something else thought more important. A censor never comes calling without reasons. And often those are good reasons. They're perfectly good reasons. In American history, for example, examples of censorship in the service of these higher values, supposed higher values, could be, I think, voluminously and tediously cataloged. I think to illustrate the dangers, you just need to point out a couple of episodes in our history that are not that old. In another time, Universities believed that winning the First World War was so important 
so critical that they terminated anti-war professors. That includes at the University of Minnesota. I'm gonna, by the way, pick on the University of Minnesota because I'm familiar with the University of Minnesota, but I don't mean to say that the University of Minnesota is special in any particular regard. I'm just very familiar with it. Uh, the day before yesterday, um, the menace of a nuclear armed enemy, which was quite real, was feared so much that the university dismissed faculty members uh, in waves of McCarthyism. Yesterday, metaphorically, one university, the University of Minnesota, deemed a person publicly declaring his marriage to another person of the same sex to be not fit to work in the library. A judge reviewing that case called his marriage a socially repugnant concept that did not have to be tolerated. Each of these deeply felt imperatives, and I think they are genuinely deeply felt, uh, the war effort, national security, interests of morality of various kinds, was allowed to supersede our commitment to the freedom of expression. Each was widely accepted in its time. And each is almost now universally condemned as a source of embarrassment and shame. Another proof of what Justice Holmes and another famous First Amendment decision called the fact that time has upset many fighting faiths. Historical experience, I think, should be sufficient for profound skepticism that the imperatives of the present day, any more than the imperatives of another earlier day, should justify a recalibration of a university's commitment to freedom of speech. So those are some just very historical, very basic uh, overview of some historical challenges. There are, I think, though, some contemporary challenges to the freedom of speech. And those, I think, probably interest us the most. Today, threats to free speech come from a number of different directions and from all sides of the political divide, including from government and social and political activists who claim that other kinds of values ought to prevail or ought to be uh, thought to be paramount. For example, some people claim that a history of discrimination, of powerlessness, or of marginalization of a group justifies restrictions on speech that they regard as offensive or hateful toward that marginalized or powerless group. Civility, inclusion, and respect are matters of fundamental human decency and dignity. These are values that contribute, I think, to a university's mission, just as free speech can, and, and spe specifically its mission of disseminating and producing knowledge and ideas by facilitating itself the expression of diverse viewpoints. University policies can, and I think should, seek to establish an environment that actively encourages things like diversity and equity and a, a friendly environment in which all are free and hopefully free of racism, sexism, homophobia, and a number, number of other forms of prejudice. There are steps that a university can take that appropriately and lawfully take these kinds of interests into account to create a welcoming, non-hostile environment. But no person, no group, merely by claiming offense should be able to bring down the disciplinary machinery of a university to prohibit or punish speech on that account alone. Um, and I was going to go through an example from the University of Minnesota, but I'm going to leave that aside for the moment, unless you'd like me to bring it up. I'll bring up another couple, so don't worry. Uh, the values of promoting a welcoming environment and climate 
are not necessarily, however, in tension with promoting the freedom of speech. Part of creating an appropriate climate, a welcoming climate at a university, is cultivating norms of debate and intellectual testing. There was a Yale-produced uh, report uh, known as the Woodward Report that concluded 50 years ago that where the values of, of equality on the one hand and speech are in conflict, the value of speech has to be considered paramount. But I don't think we necessarily even have to get there because speech itself has been so important to equality. As a matter of law and of good policy, a university's answer to the tension between equality on the one hand and speech on the other should not be to prohibit speech. At least that should not be its first answer. The cure for the ills of speech is more speech, not less speech, generally speaking. Another value uh, urged nowadays is a claimed need to level the playing field for persons and groups who do not enjoy an equal position of power or access to the mediums of communication by which speech is disseminated. And while I think those balances certainly exist, I think there's no question that they exist, they also don't justify a regulation of speech. Supreme Court decisions going back now almost half a century, 45, 45 years or so, uh, forbid restricting expression on the basis of a speaker's identity or the perceived power of that speaker in the marketplace of ideas to borrow the metaphor. And with good reason. Intractable problems arise if one goes about trying to restrict the speech of some to enhance the speech of others. Who is to be considered unequal? Which groups and which speakers? By what criteria is that inequality to be judged? Even if we could answer those questions, how much speech has to be suppressed or enhanced in order to level the playing field or equalize it? And most importantly, most importantly, who will decide the answers to all of those questions? The questions I think are very difficult, if not impossible to answer. Certainly, we shouldn't trust government officials or university administrators to answer all of these questions about who gets enough speech and who doesn't. I would go further and contend this. Not only are speech and equality in harmony, but there has been no better political friend of marginalized groups and individuals than free speech. And especially the peculiarly American libertarian conception of speech. If you think about it, identity-based social movements from the Black Civil Rights Movement to the Women's Movement to the movement that I've long been involved in most, the LGBT rights movement, have relied heavily on the protection of speech provided by the First Amendment and cognate principles. These groups have used speech to dismantle traditions of invidious discrimination, and through speech, they have mobilized allies to associate with them and to gather with them to join their efforts. So ironically, it is the unpopular and minority causes that I expect would be most vulnerable in a world where mobs and legislative majorities felt authorized to decide who may speak and how much they may speak. So with those ideas in mind, let me talk a bit about what I would, I would characterize as the timeline, the form of, for the suppression of speech, particularly on campus. So we can think about this as roughly categorized into the following. Before the speech occurs, there can be an erosion of free speech principles. During the speech and after the speech, there can be an erosion of these principles. So before a speech, the most effective way 
to suppress ideas, especially unpopular ideas on a college campus is to make sure that they are never heard, to make sure that they are never aired. A common tactic to prevent objectionable speech or silence the speakers on campus has been to pressure schools or student groups to not invite them at all, or if they have been invited, to disinvite them. Another form of this tactic is to discourage organizations from even holding panel discussions or symposia about certain controversial topics. These maneuvers, I, I should say, are used across the political spectrum from right to left to stifle, to stifle speech that is regarded as objectionable. Now, I call these tactics, the before speech ones especially, especially the negative attempt uh, to suppress expression in the sense that they are used to prevent it through importuning organizers who try to bring speakers to campus or to, through importuning, importuning university officials. Negative tactics are actually themselves a form of speech. This is perhaps an irony, but they are a form of speech. There is no restriction, certainly not in the law, on encouraging others not to invite certain speakers or host certain forums. And so the university would not be correct to try to ban a campaign of this sort or to discipline someone for organizing a disinvitation campaign. The problem is that negative campaigns make it less likely that a university will be able to attract speakers on matters of serious public policy debate. That potentially impoverishes our discourse on campus. So ordinarily, members of a university community including administrators, faculty, staff, and students, should take positive steps to counter speech that is objectionable through peaceful protest, through non-disruptive counter speech, and through critical questioning of speakers during and after they appear on campus. The university benefits from that. It benefits from objections to speech that is controversial or speech of all kinds. So that's one sort of part of the timeline. Another part of the timeline is that speech can be effectively suppressed during the speech. So once it's underway, once the speaker has been invited, once the forum is underway, it can be suppressed through serious disruption by people who oppose it. I have personally seen this tactic in operation and Oren and others from the law school at the University of Minnesota will well remember when it happened. In late 2015, an Israeli academic who had served as an advisor to the IDF was invited to speak at the law school on the topic of asymmetric warfare, uh, which is clashes, uh, combat, between conventional armies and more irregular revolutionary or insurgent forces. And that exhausts my knowledge of asymmetric warfare. So I'll leave the rest of that to Oren, but that's my understanding. So the speaker, this academic was invited to speak at the law school. During the introduction of the speaker by the Dean of the law school, there began chanting and shouting and just general pandemonium from a group of about a dozen anti-Israel pro-Palestinian demonstrators. This continued for, I would say, approximately 45 minutes. Ultimately, the, uh, the people who were disrupting the speech were escorted out, they left voluntarily, but they continued shouting outside the forum such that it was difficult to even to concentrate on the speaker, who, by the way, was largely sort of on, I would say, the dovish side of the whole question of the morality of asymmetric warfare. But that's other people may have a different view. But that was my impression. Um, ultimately, three of them were arrested when they picketed outside of the law school and refused to leave. 
No students, although students were, I believe, involved, no students were actually arrested. These were some people from outside of the law school. Disruptions by private individuals, that is people like those protesters at the speech, do not constitute government action. So the actions of those protesters were not themselves a violation of the First Amendment, uh, at this, in this case at a public university, but they are, I think, fundamentally inconsistent with the free exchange of ideas at a public university and thus are deeply illiberal, even if not illegal. There is no right to shout down a speaker, whether at a formal academic lecture, at a panel discussion, or in a more informal setting. On the other hand, non-disruptive protest, including sign carrying, picketing outside of the forum, those things are perfectly appropriate forms of counter speech. They're in fact valuable. It was valuable to have, as some of the people were, handing out flyers to, to provide their perspective on uh, issues of Israeli policy and so forth. Th that was very valuable. That's uh, where its value uh, what came to an end. A university, in my view, must thoroughly investigate and consistently punish serious violations and disruptions of speech of this kind. That is necessary in order to deter actions of that kind. But mostly, beyond the, the punishment and investigation, a university has to rely on the good faith of its faculty and its students and their good judgment that the community will not tolerate shutting down even controversial speech. So that's during speech. Then there's after speech. What happens after speech? After the speech has been completed, whether it's a panel discussion or a lecturer or um, uh, some other kind of forum, after it's been completed, the speech may be the target of efforts either by university officials and or by others to punish or at least to publicly condemn that speech in a way uh, that might be objectionable. Let me give you an example of this. And again, not to pick on the University of Minnesota, but I'm most familiar with it. Uh, in January 2015, all of you I'm sure remember, uh, there was an attack by two Islamic terrorists on the offices of Charlie Hebdo magazine, a satirical magazine published in Paris. The terrorists killed 12 writers, cartoonists, and others, including a Muslim man who had been guarding the office trying to protect those inside. That attack on Charlie Hebdo magazine was itself a response to cartoons depicting Muhammad, something that is forbidden according to some interpretations of Islam as blasphemous. After all of that transpired, some professors at the University of Minnesota organized a panel discussion just generally on the topic of free speech after this uh, attack occurred. And they disseminated a flyer promoting the panel discussion, which heard from a diversity of ideas, a diversity of perspectives. The flyer portrayed the cover of the Charlie Hebdo magazine that had been published right after the terrorist attack, right after the massacre. And it bore the image, the, the, the cover of the magazine, and therefore the flyer bore the image of Muhammad beneath the words, tout te pardonne, pardonne. My French isn't very good, but tout te pardonne, uh, which means all is forgiven. An X was then placed in the magazine, um, I'm sorry, an X was then placed on the flyer, superimposed over the cover of Charlie Hebdo magazine, presumably to suggest that speech had been suppressed or that it was in danger of suppression. 
That was disseminated, then the panel occurred. There was no disruption during the panel. Nothing like that occurred. Fine. Scores of people were in attendance. I believe there's a recording of the panel discussion. The questions after the panelists finished were probing questions from the audience and the speakers challenged one another. They were critical in, in, in many cases, but they were civil. There was a civil exchange that occurred at that time. Panel is over. After the panel concluded, a formal complaint was filed by about 200 people. Some people at the University of Minnesota, some people from outside, from, from the community. Uh, a formal complaint was filed with the university's Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action. It may go by a different name now, but it's Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action Office, which monitors developments related to campus climate and culture. The complaint specifically, we know this now, specifically cited the image on the flyer as an offense against Islam. Apparently nothing at the actual panel was said that was offensive, but the very image on the flyer itself from Charlie Hebdo magazine was offensive and that was enough to file the complaint. What happened then? There followed two months of investigation of these professors for violation of the university's policies, including its harassment policy. These professors were asked by email and in person, I believe, who was involved in the, in the development of the panel, who was involved in planning it, why was the image on the flyer chosen? What were the justifications? Did anyone consider that there might be possible offense to members of the community? What were the alternatives? All of these questions were asked. The professors had no right to see the complaint that had been filed against them. They had no right to be informed of the procedures to be used in the investigation. They had no right to counsel. They had no right to have a hearing. They had no right even to know what the evidence was against them other than perhaps the flyer. At the end of this two month period, in fact, the EOAA Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action Office found that there in fact had been no violation of university policy at all in this event, but Nevertheless, the Affirmative Action Office recommended a public censure of these professors by their department chair for contributing to a hostile climate. I was sitting at the time on the top university committee reviewing various faculty matters and we had a meeting, couple of meetings devoted to this issue at which we asked the director of the, of the investigatory office to come in and explain what had happened and what the policies were. And we asked the simple question, did you consider free speech and First Amendment interests when you recommended policy, possible policy and public censure of these individuals? And we were told, and I quote, we don't consider the First Amendment when we make recommendations about bias and hostile climate. That's at a public university this occurred. When speech, just to get off of that incident for the moment, when speech, when protected speech is the basis for such a complaint, First Amendment values are implicated. If the speaker is punished or threatened with punishment, the effect may be to chill the freedom of expression. And the university has to ensure that these investigations, any university has to ensure that these investigations do not threaten the climate for free speech on a campus. Now, I would acknowledge that extreme cases of bigoted or ill-informed statements may call for public criticism or if you want to call it censure by university officials, even if 
they are protected forms of speech and nobody can be formally disciplined for them. There is a place for public commentary and critique by officials at a university. But even then, administrators should exercise great caution and restraint when they issue these proclamations. When they do criticize speech, they should couple that condemn condemnation with a reaffirmation of a speaker's right to express his or her views. Ordinarily, ordinarily, university officials, in my view, should let the university community itself debate the ideas at stake, the offense that was given, and make a judgment as a collective about that. They should, officials should trust the university community, community to assess the merits of the speech. Because after all, when, in the case of these four professors, when they are told, and some of them were untenured, when they are told that they have contributed to the degradation of the climate at the university, they are implicitly threatened with the possibility that that will be taken into account when the decisions about their employment are made. That is a very sensitive matter for the freedom of expression. Uh, and I'll just close with this. Um, as Justice Holmes, again, uh, quoting him again, said in his famous dissent in, uh, in United States versus Abrams from 100 years ago, the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get ex itself accepted in the competition of the market. And truth is the only ground upon which our wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our constitution. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. So with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. I don't, I haven't looked at the chat yet. If you wanna read me some questions, I'm happy to answer those or just take them uh, as, as people um, speak up. Thank you, Dale. This, this, is, this was really a first rate uh, talk and, and I know uh, questions will uh, start coming. I see already some of them. Let it may take uh, the moderator's uh, privilege. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, just mention, Dale mentioned uh, at least a couple of incidences, uh, instances in the University of Minnesota, and I want to highlight Dale's really uh, steadfast kind of role in, in protecting freedom of expression on the university uh, and helping all of us who are involved in this to kind of come through. I want to uh, push two, um, uh, two issues. Um, one that you mentioned, um, kind of halfway through the talk and one that um, you raised at the beginning. Um, one concerns the heckler's veto, right? Or one of the negative campaigns. Um, as we all know, you, you kind of, you talked about the Halbertal affair and the fact that you don't have a right to interrupt speech. But as you know much better than I do, a lot of those who do engage in that claim that interrupting speech is in fact an expression of their own freedom of speech. So it would, I think, be uh, useful because a lot of us, I think, have come across this in our classrooms to give us a sense really of how to tackle uh, this when those issues come up. The second thing is uh, we talked here about incidents from uh, 2015, and I think that to some extent the, the bad winds or the ill winds that are going on or against free speech have only progressed. So if you, know, if you look at uh, Gallup poll after Gallup poll among, for example, students on American campuses and uh, both in universities and colleges, you see something very interesting. A vast majority of students are saying that free speech is of paramount importance. But at the same time, almost the same amount of students are saying that the university must curb offensive speech, that the university must uh, provide for safe spaces for students. So how do we tackle the fact that obviously the message, right, is not getting through, right? We still have a body of students and unfortunately also of professors who, whether it's they don't know any better, right, are just not understanding what free speech is all about. And I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, great questions on the, on the first question about what you, I think, rightly call the heckler's veto. 
I think it can be, I, I don't think it's inappropriate for an audience, you know, audience member to, to shake her head and in disagreement with a speaker, maybe to say something, uh, no, that's not true. Like uh, one member of Congress said to the president of the United States during a state of the union. I don't think that was a, that amounted to a heckler's veto. What I'm uh, talking about is a kind of sustained disruption of the speech that really makes it impossible for the speaker to be heard or to get a viewpoint across to the audience. The perfect example is the one that you remember, Oren, uh, from 2015 when we had the, the speaker who was disrupted. Um, I wouldn't have had any problem with a, someone booing him at the beginning or uh, shaking their head or, you know, uh, uh, that sort of hissing. I mean, there's no problem with that. I think there's a sort of feedback there that's kind of valuable actually to speakers. And I want to know how people are feeling. And so that's not a problem. What happened though, it was a coordinated campaign basically to drown out the speaker before he even began. The Dean could not continue his introduction of the speaker. And you had a hundred people wanting to hear what this speaker had to say while about a dozen or so basically vetoed the speech. Now it's one thing when you've got a speaker in a university who's gonna have other, uh, other venues to speak at that'll be more friendly. That message will get out in other ways. I am more concerned if we allow groups of people to heckle and disrupt speech speakers that are not going to be popular and don't have other means to get their message out. So that's that's a, that can be a difficult call, but I think you kind of know it when you see it um, when there's sustained disruption of a spe of speech. As far as the shifting opinions, and you know, I really should um, I think in uh, uh, I should really should have cited some of the I think alarming uh, opinion polls on college campuses about uh, attitudes toward the freedom of speech and the relative value of freedom of speech. I think um, I actually don't blame Oren. I don't blame students primarily for having these attitudes. I think it's in in fact in part. A, a salutary development that students are concerned about the equity and diversity and equality and non-discrimination. I think we've been not concerned about those things for far too long. But what I think is not getting balanced adequately is an understanding of where, what our freedom of speech actually is. And for that, I don't blame the students. I blame us. I blame the professors. I blame us in a couple of ways. Not for, first of all, not teaching basic American traditions and legal principles in a way that seems to me they ought to be taught. And second, for often not modeling the kind of civil discourse and tolerance for unpopular ideas that we want our students to exhibit. So I think that often happens. And I think we have to be, we have to take some responsibility for this. Um, if we don't take responsibility for it, I'm concerned that universities, which fear their legal liability and the pressure that they're facing from a variety of legal sources, will just have to clamp down or feel like they have to clamp down to avoid um, uh, significant uh, exposure. Thank you, Dale. So we have already several questions in the chat. Um, and so let me call on those who asked to, if you can just kind of Succinctly put your question. Uh, we want to try and put as many as possible. Tammy, um, Spencer, can we mute, uh, unmute Tammy? Yeah, hi, and thank you so much. This was really terrific. Um, my question has to do with what seems to be a double standard when it comes to free speech and anti-discrimination law, that when you have speech that's directed against students whose identity is protected under, let's say, Title VI, that speech, if it's, if it's deemed to be harassing speech, speech that is in and of itself a form of harassment, it's deemed to be um, uh, unprotected speech. Uh, but, but when it's directed against students that whose identity uh, or who are not um, uh, um, being directed, you know, that speech is not directed then because of a protected identity, let's say, let's say because they're Trump supporters, right? Um, that that speech is considered 
unprotected speech, or excuse me, protected speech. So there's just seems with respect to the First Amendment, it seems like the anti-discrimination law, um, which, which deems harassing speech to be unprotected speech, it just, there's a double standard that, that come, that sort of in effect, de, de facto double standard here. And I wonder as a, as a, you know, I wonder how we deal with that because it, to me, it seems terribly unfair. It seems that you, ha you really have a two tiered campus with respect to freedom of speech. Yeah, so that's, that's a great point. So, um, Non-discrimination law inherently draws lines and attempts to protect based on classifications that are regarded as especially troublesome. I mean, the problems of racial discrimination, anti-religious discrimination sometimes extends to other forms of discrimination. Title VI is an example of this. For example, it actually doesn't include religious discrimination, but includes other forms of discrimination. Um, so equality norms are inherently um, inherently weighted in favor of certain kinds of values that need to be, get get extra protection. I would say this: there are a lot of steps that a university can take to try to equalize the environment for protected classes or groups of people who are historically been sub subjected to discrimination. But if the university is making content-based or certainly not viewpoint-based distinctions uh, to punish speech. If it's really speech, protected speech, that is not permitted under the First Amendment, even if the value that is being invoked is an equality value. Um, so we, we've had examples of, of uh, Trump supporters, for example, I think you mentioned uh, the Trump campaign. The, the Trump supporters, for example, saying build that wall on a sign, uh, echoing some of his uh, mm -hmm. slogans who were, it was claimed, had, uh, should not have their speech protected. That was a, I, I stand second to nobody in my opposition to Donald Trump and to many of the things that he did, but that is protected speech. There is no, we have to, I think, teach the basic principle that just because you're offended by speech does not mean that you get to suppress it. It has to be much, much more than that. Um, Ernest, if you can unmute. Uh, and since I'm, I'm also cognizant of the time, let's try and keep the questions um, short. Sure. We have Ernest and then Dan. So uh, maybe I'm only allowed one question, so I'll just ask one at this point. And if you have time for me later. Uh, okay. So if I'm teaching a class in my university, which is a state university, and there's a heckling or disruption in a regular classroom setting, I can call the campus police, police and the student will be, or the person will be escorted out. However, in a formally invited event, a speaker uh, can be heckled and it's much more difficult and much more problematic to remove the hecklers who are disrupting the speech. Why can we not consider a formally invited guest to be uh, time and a place for speech that is equally protected as a classroom. Yeah, so I think, um, um, so what I would say about that is when you're in a classroom and you're conducting a lecture or you're, you're conducting your class, the university has at least a couple of very important, but also perhaps distinct issue, distinct values at stake. One of them is that it has a general interest in having there be academic freedom and freedom of speech expression of ideas. But the other interest is that it's acting in a, in a sort of managerial capacity. Certainly the professor has the, the ability and it's perfectly legally possible for a professor to choose what the subject will be, to choose where the questions will go, to call on speakers in a way that would be offensive if say, Donald Trump decided I'll only allow people to speak whom I want to have speak. That would not be permissible at all. So I think that the classroom environment is a, is a distinct environment and it's a much more controlled environment. I also do think though that it should be possible, certainly if someone is being seriously disruptive at a, an academic lecture for the university to call in the 
uh, campus security and, 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 and escort the people out or to cite people who are disrupting the speech. I don't have a problem uh, uh, with that whatsoever. But it, it, it may infringe on, the, you mentioned that it may be considered protest. Well, so it, it certainly can be protest um, if it occurs outside and it's not disruptive, um, or if it's just kind of quiet and you know I'm not going to listen to the speaker, I'm going to bow my head or do whatever, something minimal. That can uh, certainly a form of protest. I wouldn't want to try to get the government, the university in this case, to take those people out. But it's only if they're preventing uh, the speaker from speaking and others from hearing what the speaker has to say that I think the uh, university officials can properly step in. And there's a, there's a line there uh, between the two, but it's a line that we can draw. We, we draw lines all the time in the First Amendment. But often, okay, often academic administrations are not courageous enough to do it. Yeah. I agree with you. No, we are, we are not disagreeing here at all. I think I could, I have personal knowledge of cases in which I think university officials should have taken a more affirmative series of steps to protect speakers and to uh, ensure that it's that disruptions are deterred in the future. And, and, and on this one, I, I also uh, point to Sheldon's uh, comment uh, about uh, uh, courage or lack thereof of university administrators and the need to basically um, kind of broadcast this from the top. Um, Ernest kind of talked about one element of the classroom and also invited speech with interruptions. I think that Dan's question is almost the flip side of that, Dan. You're, you need to unmute. Yeah, okay, so, so let me, let me uh, ask. So Dan is basically asking, is there any limit on what a professor can say in a classroom, uh, including can the he or she engage in academically irrelevant political diatribes? Uh, um, <clears throat> so I think every university has um, uh, principles of academic freedom that govern what can, can be said and have to be allowed in classrooms. I would say if a teacher is, is, is doing things in the classroom that are irrelevant to the subject matter that are just demonstrably false, if if in, in chemistry class you're teaching alchemy, uh, you, can, you, can be, you can be relieved of your duties. If you're teaching astrology instead of astronomy, you can be relieved of your duties. There are limits even to academic freedom, much as we hate to admit that there are. So uh, it looks like my sound is back on. And uh, well, thanks for a great talk. Uh, for the sake of little debate, though, this wasn't one of the principles or, or exceptions you itemized earlier. You mentioned obscenity, you mentioned libel, you mentioned incitement to illegal action. You didn't mention academic irrelevance uh, or uh, violent political diatribes. And I brought this up also because of uh, Tammy Benjamin's question about anti-discrimination. It seems to me that we as members of the academic engagement network are caught in a bit of a contradiction because when anti-Semitic speech comes up on campus, the first thing that many of us call for is for the president to repudiate it and for um, perhaps even disciplining of the, uh, of, of the speaker. It might be um, a member of student government who says very nasty things about uh, Israel in a Facebook post, or it might be a professor engaging in political propaganda in the classroom. Um, so I think there's a thorny complex of issues here, which you may be consistent on, but um, I'm not sure the spirit of the, you know, I, I'm not sure many members of the AEN have really figured out where we stand on this and perhaps your talk, you know, uh, is helpful to clarify that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, it's hard to be consistent when you really, really dislike things that people are saying and when you think those things are potentially dangerous to the extent that someone is inciting uh, violence, that is certainly outside the protection of the First Amendment. On the irrelevance point, if you're saying things that are in the classroom that are irrelevant or that are just demonstrably wrong in your field, uh, the university has a managerial interest, it seems to me, that stands aside from ideological suppression of ideas. 
that um, it can exercise and properly act upon. But I, I think you're right. I mean, look, um, one of the hardest cases we've ever had in First Amendment law involves not just anti-Semitism, but involves, as everybody here I'm sure knows, the attempt by a group of Nazis to march through a neighborhood of Holocaust survivors uh, at Skokie in the late 1970s. The person who defended the right of those uh, Nazis to march was himself Jewish and certainly not sympathetic to the claims that these uh, marchers were making. The speech that we have the most difficulty with, I think, is the speech we most violently dis disagree with. And therefore, I think we have to make an extra effort to allow for that speech to occur. I did say, Dan, and I hope I was, I was clear about this, I do think there are times and there are, there are occasions when it's appropriate for university officials to speak out and say, we con I condemn this speech. We condemn this speech. It's outside of of our norms of discourse. You shouldn't be saying things like that, but your rights are protected. But I want you to know we as a community do not accept them. That's a delicate thing, especially when someone's job is on the line or when someone's grade is on the line. But it, there are occasions when it can be done. Thank you. Isn't that the irony regarding Tammy's question though? Sorry to butt in. But hold on, hold on, hold on for, ju for just a second, because I, I want to make sure that I, I, I wrap uh, some others in and then and then uh, kind of wrap up. I'm also, again, aware of everybody's time. Uh, I, I also think, by the way, Dale, that, that we can also make a distinction here between condemning speech, sanctioning speech, and issues of professionalism in the classroom, right? So, you know, if I'm teaching a classroom on contracts and I launch into, you know, a half a semester into political diatribe, I'm basically not doing my job. Right, and that's not a question of academic freedom. That's just not doing uh, uh, my job. Um, I see Mark and I see Sheldon. Uh, if you want to kind of really briefly um, ask a question, Mark, do you want to? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, not a humanist. And what I see in my environment is just that when there are controversial issues, professors keep silent because it's not directly uh, impacting their own work. And uh, just shutting off, shutting up is a less uh, threatening attitude when there are controversies. So you sp spoke a lot of freedom of speech, but how do you get professors to speak? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that as a, as a comment instead of a question, because I think it's a great point. And, and I think it goes back, I think, to Sheldon's uh, earlier note about uh, the courage of administrators. We can uh, also uh, uh, encompass professors in that. Uh, I also note uh, Carrie Nelson's uh, uh, distinction, which I think uh, Dale made between uh, repudiating and kind of objecting to objectionable speech uh, and suppressing or sanctioning that. Uh, which I think is a, uh, a distinction that Dale uh, kind of amply made during the talk. Uh, Miriam, any uh, final thoughts before we kind of wrap up? This was really wonderful. And I know I took like a pad full of notes and also on the comments. Um, we grapple with the issues that were raised, that you've raised and that were raised in the chat all the time. Uh, we get the questions from students, from faculty members, from administrators, how to respond to this incident, that incident, this objectionable speech, that objectionable speech. And um, you know what, what we really value at AEN is the diversity of thought on these issues. Um, and you know, we don't have like hive mind at mm -hmm. AEN. We really do have a lot of disagreement over the right methods, the right strategies, the effective strategies, how to parse out these things. And, and at AN, I think what we wanna do is what you said, um, Dale, in the initial part of your talk was, we wanna model the right behavior, right? We wanna model civility, tolerance, viewpoint diversity, uh, and also be courageous. 
So I think, I think our faculty are courageous. When we see really awful, ugly, vile, bad speech, we speak up about it. Um, and we bring in better speech. So AN throws a lot of money out to our members to bring better speech to the campuses. That's a big part of what we do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think that, that we'll still have a lot of disagreements. Um, I think the issue of when should administrators speak and when should they not speak and is administrations when they exercise their own right to free speech, does it chill speech? That's a really, really thorny issue. And I think, you know, we're continuing to, to uh, uh, grapple with that one. Um, but I uh, uh, was so grateful, Dale, for, um, you know, you're spending the time with us. I hope you'll continue to engage and we can continue to share our work and our thoughts with you. So thank you, uh, Miriam. Thank you, AEN, for making this possible. Thank you all for uh, attending in this uh, late hour with Zoom fatigue. And of course, thank you to Dale Carpenter for yet another first-rate talk.